<laughs> Hi, thanks. Really glad to be here. Believe it or not, it's the first time I've ever been to DICE. I should have been earlier, but I don't know. I got tied up on other things, I guess. Anyway, in my experience in brand building, the experts are almost always wrong. And if you listen to them, you're really going to screw up your business. And experts traditionally are wrong. How about Lord Kelvin? On flying, heavier than air flying machines are impossible, said by the head of the Academy of Science in 1895. Or on telephones, that's an amazing invention, but who would ever want to use one of them, said President Rutherby B. Hayes. I guess presidents often say dumb things. <laughs> on large scale computers, I think in the world there's maybe a market for five of them, said Tom Watson, who founded IBM. He might have been off by a little bit. On personal computers, there's no reason anyone would want a computer in their home, said Ken Olson, founder of Digital Equipment, not that long ago, 1977. And then my favorite is on Apple. There is no hope Steve should shut the company down and return any money in the company to its shareholders, said Michael Dell in 1997 when Steve returned to Apple. So experts are, are usually wrong. And I'm going to get a little retro on you. I'm going to go back <clears throat> 45 years of, of being involved in building brands. I'm going to talk a little bit about Flintstones and Barbie and He-Man and uh, Sega and Sonic and, and then LeapFrog, where I'm still the vice chairman of the company. So on Flintstones, back in 1967, Miles Laboratories was a client of J. Walter Thompson, and I worked in a, in a unit there that worked on new products and for existing clients. And they had a vitamin called Chalks. And Bristol Myers brought out PALs, which were animal shaped and multicolored and fruit flavored. And Chalk's business just went to zero. And so Miles said to us, Well, we need a new, we need a new vitamin. So we went out and did all this research Disney characters and Hanna Barbera characters and other characters and came up with Flintstones. But the problem was, Flintstones had just gone off of primetime TV and was now on Saturday morning TV. And so the media experts and marketing consultants at Miles Laboratories in Elkhart, Indiana said, what are you, crazy? This thing's on Saturday morning now. It's, it's a, dead, a dead license. It's going away. Go back and do more research. So we did. And we came back a few weeks later and we said, you got to do it. Got to do Flintstones. And they said, well, OK, we don't have anybody here to run the business. So if you'll come out and run it in Elkhart, we'll do it. So we went out and we launched Flintstones. And six months later, it was the number one children's vitamin in the market. And, uh, the market was quite small in those days, under $100 million. <clears throat> Today, it's still the number one vitamin in the market, and it's a billion-dollar uh, market that it competes in. So what are the lessons from Flintstones? Solve, we, one of the things you got to do in brand building is solve a problem. Well, we solved a problem. Moms had trouble getting vitamins and minerals into their children because they didn't eat properly, just like today they don't eat properly. And the media experts were obviously wrong. Having a show on Saturday morning TV could be awfully powerful. It got even better when it went on syndicated TV five days a week after, after school. OK, so I was hired out of, out of Flintstones by Mattel. And initially, I worked on the preschool business, c and says and Jack in the Boxes and putt putts. And uh, one day, Ruth Handler, the founder of Mattel, walked into my cubicle in 1973. My cubicle was right outside the men's room, so I had a lot of traffic. And she said, she said, Tom, Barbie's sales declined this year to $43 million, down from almost $100 million. And my sales force says it's over. The retail buyers say it's over. The Wall Street analysts say it's over. It better go on to something else. What do you think about all that? And I said, Ruth, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Barbie will be around long after you and I are gone. And she said, that's what I wanted to hear. You're now the marketing product director on Barbie. <laughs> And she also said to me, remember, with Barbie, a girl can be whatever she wants to be. And I took those words to heart, and I used those for the next 15 years in every advertisement that you ever heard for, for Barbie. Hey, girls, with Barbie, you can be anything you want to be. But I believed it. But I also did a segmentation of the market that hadn't been done before. It used to be the company brought out one doll and one line of fashions and one accessory, and I said, to heck with that. We're going to do a lot of dolls. So we did my first Barbie, which was Velcro and Snap, so a young two, three-year-old girl could dress Barbie. And I did a very inexpensive Malibu Barbie, so anybody could afford it, $2.50, $2.95, buy a Barbie. But then you had to buy costumes and accessories to play with. 
But I did the opposite of that. I did very expensive dolls for the older collector market. Worked with Oscar de Lorena, a great man. Bob Mackey. And these dolls were $100. So that was obviously for the high end. And I also did occupation Barbies. Did Dr. Barbie and Teacher Barbie. In 1976, I did President Barbie. And today I notice they're doing Entrepreneur Barbie and Veterinarian Barbie. And every year we do an expensive home, townhouse, dream house, glamour home. And that was the hardware, just like hardware, software, hardware, a house. You gotta put furniture in it, that has high margin. You gotta put dolls in it, that has high margin. You gotta put other friends in it, that has high margin. So today the average retailer has 48 feet of Barbie. Oh, I redid all the packaging. It was all different colors and I made it all pink. It still is today. And the Barbie lessons were, you can grow the brand by segmenting the market through age and positioning and, and price. You gotta own your own retail space. You gotta reflect current adult trends. And let's use a hardware software model. So Barbie sales went from the 43 million while I was on the business up to about 550. I turned it over to a gal named Jill Barad who took it to almost two billion. A fantastic marketer. And today, the sales have declined. They had a tough year. But it's still a billion, $100,000 brand. Over $100 million are sold each year. Two per second, the average girl owns 10. Still a very, very important children's business. <clears throat> anyway, I got promoted to president of Mattel. And we didn't have a male action line. Hasbro had Star Wars and, and G.I. Joe. And we didn't have anything. Well, they had Big Jim for a while, but it didn't last long. And so we went out again and did the research, researched the Marvel characters, the DC characters, the Disney characters, every TV show and, and movie that came along. And we also did this, these fantasy characters. And lo and behold, this strange, heroic fantasy, muscular character, He-Man, and his adversary, Skeletor, won as being what the boys wanted at that period of time. And so we produced it. It became a $75 million brand. Not bad, but the chairman of Mattel came into my office one day and he said, well, it's nice you got a $75 million business, but it'll never really be that important because you don't have a TV show or a movie and you can't get one. And I said, you want to bet? And so I worked with Group W and Filmation Studios and we each put up half of $7.5 million and we initially produced 65 shows. Each had a moral message at the end of the show, which was kind of novel in those days. And we gave them to the TV stations across the country, gave it to them free. But in return, they gave us three 30-second spots, which we either used to advertise our products or we sold. Well, the show became a smash hit. I bet a lot of you remember, I have the power, right? And uh, we ended up making profit off the television show, which was not expected. But we also, the brand built to $750 million in 1983, and on top of that, we had a lot of licensing income from books and clothing and other things. And we also did a movie that wasn't too good with Dolph Lundgren, but anyway, we had a TV show <laughs> that was on and around for, I think it still is running in, in some, some markets. So He-Man Lessons. Research really can produce a, a great products and great brands, even though I don't always believe in research. And persistence overcomes negativity, and. And we were the, it was, this was the first time a toy company had produced a successful television show. And by the way, 30 minutes of TV five days a week really does help drive, drive sales. And this became the model for toy companies with brands from then on. I mean, we did Princess of Power and Rainbow Bright and Captain, Power, all kinds of different television shows uh, after that. Anyway, let's move on. So I'm skipping over a little bit, but uh, I was on vacation in Hawaii with my family. I have six children. And uh, this Japanese guy shows up, Hayao Nakayama, and, and he says, you got to come to Japan with me and look at 16-bit technology and color LCD portable unit. And I said, why? <laughs> he said, well, we, because I want you to become CEO of Sega of America. And he, we'd actually talked before, but he did track me down, which I thought was a little bizarre. And uh, so I went. And I fell in love with 16-bit technology. Now, remember at Mattel, I was familiar with Intellivision and what video games looked like then. And I kind of skipped a period. I didn't really pay much attention to 8-bit. But boy, this sure looked a lot different. But everybody said to me, no, 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 you can't go there. Nintendo has 92 plus percent of the market, and Sega has nothing. You got Shinobi, 
they got Mario. Uh, you can't go, you'll, you, you won't be successful. But, and by the way, the whole, this whole story it, uh, it was mentioned earlier is in a book called Console Wars by Blake Harris, who interviewed 300 people in the industry back in those days. And the book is actually selling very well, and a documentary's been shot. It's going to be out. I'm in the documentary. It'll be out in, uh, in end of March or April, I believe. And Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg, <clears throat> who've been in a little trouble recently, are writing the feature film script right now. And Scott Rudin, who produced Moneyball and Social Network and Captain Phillips and Budapest Hotel and lots of other things, have, has agreed to produce the, the, the movie. And the story t is told a lot better than I'm going to be able to tell it today. But anyway, I studied the market. I had made a deal with Nakayama-san that I would take this position if I could make the decisions for the Western world for Sega. And he said, yeah, that's absolutely it. You got it. So I went back to Japan a few months later to the board meeting. And I said, OK, guys, here's what we're going to do. We're going to lower the price of the Genesis from, from $200 to $149. We're going to take Altered Beast out of the hardware bundle. And we're going to put our best title in, which is Sonic the Hedgehog. It was in development at the time, almost done. And uh, we're going to change the market. We're going to go after teens and college age students. We're going to forget the 10 and 12-year-old market that Nintendo has. Let them have it. And we're going to attack Nintendo in advertising. We're going to make fun of them. We're going to position them as the little kids' video game system. And the board started talking in all Japanese. Of course, I didn't understand it. And somebody's translating in my ear. And he says to me, well, basically, they think you're nuts. And they disagree with everything you said. Because if you lower the price, we don't have a profit on the hardware. If you then put our best title in, we lose the profit off a, a software sale we would have otherwise had. And of course, attacking this giant company, Nintendo, is, is crazy. It's ludicrous. And uh, Nakayama got up after about 45 minutes and was going to leave the room. And I thought, man, this is the shortest career anybody ever had. <laughs> <clears throat> but he turned at the door and he said, when I hired you, I agreed that you could make the decisions for the Western world. So we're going to support you. Uh, go ahead and do all this stuff that you said to do. And then, by the way, I had to hire like a 1,000 people in Redwood Shores to produce uh, software and, and, and have the marketing team together. And, and one of the things I would say, of course, that was so important is I hired the best team that you could possibly have worked with. You know, Al Nielsen and Madeline Schroeder and Joe Miller, Paul Rio. These were in just, just fantastic people that, that I got onto the, the team. And Sonic became a huge hit. The Sonic team then moved from Japan next to us in Redwood Shores, and we worked on Sonic 2, which became a great hit, too. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but remember Sonic Tuesday? It was the first time a game was launched worldwide the same hour across the world where it appeared in retail stores uh, at that moment. And we did that by shipping via Emory Air Freight and became a way of doing business that others copied after that. And remember, we did some pretty aggressive advertising. Uh, Sega does what Nintendo don't. <laughs> Welcome to the next level. And then we got even more aggressive. The Sega Genesis has blast processing. Super Nintendo doesn't. So what's blast processing do? If you don't have blast processing? Sega! Sega! <laughs> so br blast processing, of course, was revolutionary. Um, <laughs> uh, one funny story, a side story. We couldn't get into Walmart. You know, Nintendo was so powerful that some third parties were afraid to publish on the Genesis because they might have gotten punished by Nintendo. And some retailers were afraid to carry Sega because they might get not quite the amount of hardware they'd ordered or the software they'd ordered. At least that was their fear. And Walmart wouldn't take us. And this really hurt my feelings because I knew Sam Walton back when I was at Mattel and I worked with all the executives there. And I couldn't believe it. And after my third attempt of them turning us down, we were driving out on Highway 49 and uh, 8th Street. And, Bentonville, you ever been to Bentonville? It's not a very big place. And I saw this strip mall, and there was a store for rent. And so I rented it. I shouldn't say I, my team rented it. 
And we put up a big sign, come play Sega Genesis for free. And we put like 24 big TVs at the time big and Genesis in there. And uh, there were lines of teenagers playing our games. I then bought every billboard that was led in and out of Bentonville. I bought all the radio time and the TV time that I could. And down the road is the University of Arkansas. And they used to do, you know where you hold up things and it makes, says different things around the stadium? Well, they had seat cushions that were different color. But on the other side of them, I bought the, the rights to have Sega printed across it. So when they held up their seat cushions, you'd see Sega all over the stadium. It was kind of fun. And then I'd call the vice president in charge of the video game area, and I'd say, Rich, you know, this week at Target, we actually are selling equal to Nintendo. And at uh, Best Buy and Software, et cetera, and Babbage's, we're outselling Nintendo. <laughs> Pretty soon he called me back and he said, I surrender, I give up. My board of directors is wondering why we're not carrying you, and of course we will now. So we did a lot of fun at Sega. My team did some wonderful things. We were the first with lots and of different things. We led in a lot of areas. Again, we did a Sonic both network show and, and syndicated show. We were the first to sponsor MTV. We were the first to sponsor rock concerts across the country. We uh, built Sa Sonic to be more popular than, than uh, Mickey Mouse. We had more women in management than any other company, video game company of the time. Mo uh, at least half of my key uh, executives were female. And that was unusual back then. We did the first cable delivery of video games. It's, you know, remember, we didn't have internet uh, back then. <coughs> And we did our own rating system, because remember, we did put blood in Mortal Kombat, uh, and, or allow blood to be shown in Mortal Kombat. So we did our first rating, the first rating system that eventually became the ESRB. I mean, it's almost the same rating system we did. And we started the, we led on the start of the IDSA, which became the Software Association. And, uh, and uh, lots and lots of other things that we did that were, that were first. So our sales went from 70-something million on, to about a billion and a half. We passed Nintendo in share of market in the mid-90s. We did another billion in Europe. And the market cap of Sega went from one and a half billion to five billion. So lots of, lots of things that were different. We changed the age of the average game player to 21. I think Sony says it's 31 today. Uh, we priced hardware low, software high. We were very aggressive in going after the competition. We were cool, they were the cool brand. And we were very bold in what we did. And obviously, again, we owned our own retail space. And we, I think we were very creative in our, our brand building and our, in our marketing. Now, I left Sega because of a lot of reasons. It's described in the book. But largely, I, they stopped letting me make the decisions for, <laughs> for the Western world. And at the same time, Mike Milken and Larry Ellison offered me an unusual opportunity to do something I really wanted to do, which was to use video game technology to improve education. And they each invested $250 million, so I had $500 million to play with, and our, our, our mission was very simple. We were gonna use technology to improve education for all ages. And so we did 36 different companies. About 18 we started ourselves, and about 18 we bought when they were small, and we, and we grew them. And uh, one of those, in, by 2005, by the way, we were doing over two billion in revenue, so in nine years we'd been quite successful. And at that time we divided the assets back to the investors. But one of the things I stuck, stuck with, I stayed on as CEO of LeapFrog, which we founded by a great guy named Mike Wood, and uh, his mission was to teach reading initially. And, and, you know, again, when we bought the company, the Wall Street experts said, don't, don't do this. Education doesn't sell. Moms say they want it, but they won't pay the price for education in their, in their products. So don't do it. But we went ahead and we did it because we believed we were solving a problem. 50% of U.S. kids start kindergarten with, they're unable to really function in a kindergarten setting. And you know, by the way, we still only graduate 69% of our, our high school students. So we were working on a problem. We were created to do learning well. We worked with Stanford and Berkeley professors and a few others, but we knew we had to make it fun if we were gonna keep the kids with us. And we knew we could use video game technology to adapt the curriculum to the child and to and to some degree personalize it for each, for each child. We had our own proprietary uh, set of, of uh, skills and a scope and sequence, which no other company for preschoolers had. And we were quite successful. We, 
We sold over 60 million platforms and hundreds of millions of software, whether that was in the form of a book or, or software that worked on our, our, our mobile game unit or our, or our tablets. Our, our tablets, by the way, are the best-selling children's tablets in the market, even though last year was not a great year for, for tablet sales. But still, believe it or not, this is what learning looks like. Introducing Meep TV, the new educational video game system from LeapFrog. With three ways to play that get kids up and active, and more than 100 fun-filled games and videos that teach reading, math, and more. You'll be happy they're learning. They'll just be happy. Leap TV gets minds and bodies moving. So I'm back in the video game business that hooks to your TV wirelessly, a camera on the te television, puts your child into the game, your child's interacting with other characters and learning how to read and learning math. So lessons from LeapFrog? Well, let me go on to overall lessons because I think I'm just about out of time here. Don't believe the experts solve a real problem, solve a real pain point that someone has. Hire, hire the great, best people you can, surround yourself with a wonderful team. I've been very fortunate to have been able to do that throughout my life. And have great advisors who buy in to your vision and get rid of the naysayers fast because they just distract you. And have a strategy that others can't copy. If you have a strategy that's easy to copy, I would say you don't have a strategy. And be bold. And most important, tell an interesting story. You know, position your brand so that it's interesting. And, and celebrate failure. We used to have a celebrate failure day where we'd give a thousand dollar check to the guys who had the best failure, had the best rationale, but still failed. But it was worth doing. So, anyway, thanks very much. I'm still busy using technology to help improve education. <laughs>